because the very hands that held the stars were now sentenced to wear my scars. It was love that purchased this traitor's heart. What the prophets spoke about when they envisioned life living in many once again. For this reason, I am legend, predestined for greatness, built for the final hour. I continuously see on YouTube tons of people who, you know, make lots of videos and or debates I'll hear where they continuously will say they'll they'll beat on the Catholics of course and they'll go, you know, hey, justification is by grace through faith and not of works. And then they turn and then they'll go, but then the Calvinists they go way too far that God is just sitting back going any mini money mo and I pick who who I want. And uh, we know that's absurd, they say. We know that God gives us free will, and therefore God is not picking unconditionally anyone to salvation. They pick and choose verses, Calvinist. So I figured what I would do, rather than directly responding specifically to a few individuals on YouTube, I would just go directly to the truth, the Word of God, and I'd like to just spell out giving you some scriptures and some things I think are important for many people. If you do not agree that God is in control of everything, maybe you should first study understanding whether or not God is in control of all things except human beings, which I'm going to show some scriptures that support. God is in control of humans, too. For example, number one, God exercises that sovereignty actively in ordaining everything. Deuteronomy 32, 39. 1 Samuel 2, 6-8. Job 9.12, Job 12.6-10, Psalms 33.11, Psalms 115.3, Psalms 135.6, Isaiah 14.24, Isaiah 45.7, Acts 15.18, Ephesians 1.11. 1 First, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an idea in the Psalms uh, 115 and the 135. The Lord does whatever He pleases among the host of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth. He pretty much, He does whatever He pleases. We look in Ephesians 1.11, it says, uh, talking about predestination, let's, let's look at it real quick. It says this, let's go right here, Ephesians 1.11, it says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, who is this? God, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So we see that God works all things, okay? Well, most people will go, well, not the human beings. We, he created human beings. That's the one thing he's not in control of. Well, I'll put it this way. He's in, 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 this includes the sovereignty is including over matters of chance. Proverbs 16.33 says that the dice is rolled into the, hand, into the lap, and the Lord, it says that the dice is rolled into the lap, but it's every decision is of the Lord. So, really, there is no randomness, so no chance. 1 Kings 22, 20, uh, 34, chapter 34, and 37. Uh, the wicked actions of men God is sovereign over. I don't even know. Maybe I should define sovereign for you. I am saying sovereign as in not just sitting back and watching, but he is sovereign in Causing the acts to, to occur in control of what's happening, yet is not responsible. That's first and secondary causes and so forth. That's going another route. That's going deeper into this understanding. But we're going to go straight into this. The wicked actions of men. Genesis 45, 5. Genesis 50, 20. Exodus 4, 21. Judges 14, 1. 1 through 4, Psalm 76, verse 10, Proverbs 16, 4. He even uh, he made the day, even the day of wicked for destruction. So, you know, uh, Isaiah 44, 28, Amos 3, 6, Acts 2, 22 through 23, Acts 4, 27 through 28. And it literally is talking about God predestining the acts that occurred to his own holy son, the son of God. We're talking about the most hideous act. God was in working and crushing his son, as Isaiah 53 says. So we see also the action of evil spirits. 
Now, Derek, you're going somewhere where most people don't go. Most people want to say Satan's in control of the evil realm. God's in control over the good realm. Well, that right there is dualism, people. That God is not in control of what happens in evil. Satan just going to come after me, and for some reason, he has power over evil, but God only has power over good, because God is good, therefore he cannot be sovereign over evil. That's false. People believe because God can create something, therefore he is what he creates. That is called pantheism. Our God is sovereign and above all things. He is not the creation or the created thing. He had no created time. He is self-existing. I am that I am. So moving on. Evil spirits. 1 Samuel 16, 14 through 16. 1 Kings 22, 19 through 23. 1 Chronicles 21 and 2 Samuel 24, 1. Very awesome spot. I'd rather make a whole other video on that. But it's talking about, in 1 Chronicles and 2 Samuel, Satan incited uh, against David and God incited against David. Same account, different books. What is he saying here? Did Satan do it? Did God do it? Or was it an act of God using Satan? So, we go here. The good actions of men. Okay? John 15, 16. Ephesians 2, 2, 10. Says, He prepared good works. He predestined us for good works. Those who were His chosen unconditionally. Philippians 2, 12 through 13. It talks about God works through you to will and to work. Righteousness. Um... The actions of good angels. We see Psalms 103.20, Psalms 104.4. The actions of animals. Numbers 22.28, 1 Kings 17.4, Psalms 29.9, Jeremiah 8.7, Ezekiel 32.4, Daniel 6.22. The operations of all creation. Genesis 8.22, Psalms 104.5-10, Psalms 104.13-14, 19-20, Mark uh, 4.39, uh, man is not permitted to question God's sovereignty. First off, Job 33, 12-13, Isaiah 29, 16, Isaiah 45, 9-10, Matthew 20, 1-16, Romans 9, 19-24. We see that we're not supposed to question it. It was a given is a norm. There wasn't councils that gathered together in those days and went, you know what, this whole predestination thing, unconditional election, this isn't true. We're going to debate. We didn't see this. This was, this was solid, firmly understood, thrown out throughout the scriptures, all throughout the scriptures, all throughout it. So, now we're at God's election, God unconditionally election, electing, choosing, predestining, foreordaining specific individuals. Well, first of all, his angels. 1 Timothy 5, 21. His peculiar people, Israel. Number two, Exodus 6, 7. Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8. Deuteronomy 10, 14 through 15. Psalms 33, 12. And Isaiah 43, 20 through 21. Now we're at individuals, individuals to salvation. You need to write this stuff down, brothers and sisters, because I really want you to look at all these passages. I want you to see the picture of the whole Bible in, a, in one big picture and understand this is the way God operates. Psalm 65, 4. Matthew 24, 24. John 6, 37. John 15, 16, Acts 13, 48, <laughs> all of these. He says that um, those who are foreordained to eternal life believed, not those who believed had eternal life. Or those who, were, who believed were foreordained for eternal life. That was just, it, it, the way it turns is it was unconditional. It was those who were foreordained, those are the ones who believed. Romans 8, 28 through 30, commonly misunderstood passage. Romans 9, 10 through 24. Romans 11, 5 through 7. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6 and 11 through 12. 1 Thessalonians 1, 4. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 14. And now we're, I'll, I'll touch back, but now we're talking about individuals to condemnation. Exodus 4, 21. Romans 9, 13. Romans 9, 17 through 18. Romans 9, 21 through 22. 1 Peter 2, 8. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. 
I could actually expound more. I could actually go through Eli's sons and other situations to to show you it is the will of the Lord that this happens and these things occur. God is specifically electing individuals. He's choosing individuals. He didn't just look and say, well, I know Paul, and Paul one day is going to do, he's going to follow me. He's going to come to me. I choose Paul. First, I got to make sure he chose me first. I got to make sure I don't interrupt his free will. I'm going to choose him after he chooses me. Those are the people I see, and then I'm going to choose. No. Romans 8, 28. For whom he foreknew, he predestined. You would say most of the time, oh, it's just looking down. There are many people who've touched on this without even getting exhaustive on this. The foreknowing or the foreknew is intimate, relational. Period. Relational. I mean, he says to Jeremiah, before you were formed in the belly of the womb, uh, I knew you. I knew you. Not, I knew you were going to be formed in the belly of the womb, or I knew about you, or I knew who you would be, or this is just something I knew. God works all things according to the counsel of his will, and so God knew him. Intimate. Adam knew Eve, and they bore a child. There are other uh, significant uh, passages that speak that God knew Israel, but did not know everyone else. Are you saying God's limited in this knowledge and doesn't know everyone? No. The term knew actually meant relational. I mean, it, it, it's pretty obvious when you when you study the passage, the Greek word is pro, uh, uh, prognosko, pro, prognosko. And so it's actually talking about a relational sense. So enough touched on that. His motivation in election is his own good pleasure, Ephesians 1, 5, 2 Timothy 1, 9. The display of his glory, Isaiah 43, 6 through 7, Romans 9, 22, uh, 22 through 24, 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 31, Ephesians 2, 4 through 7, Proverbs 16, 4, which is a deep one, uh, number three, his special love, Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8, and uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13. He chose Israel, and he tells them why he chose them. He says, I, I chose you because I loved you, and I loved you because I loved you. Not because you were a greater number or you did anything. Uh, not because he knew they would do anything, because they didn't do anything. God saved them, chose them, took them out of Egypt. He took them out of bondage. He does the same for us. Uh, his foreknowledge. Romans 8, 29. 1 Peter 1, 2, which means his special love. Jeremiah 1, 5. Amos 3, 2. Matthew 7, 22 through 23. 1 Corinthians 8, 3. 2 Timothy 2, 19. 1 Peter 1, 20. But not any good nobility, wisdom, power, choice-seeking, he foresees in anyone. None of that. None on their on their condition. Deuteronomy 7.7. 7. Romans 9.11-13. Romans 9.16. Not on the man who wills or runs, but on God who has mercy. Romans 10.20. 1 Corinthians 1.27-29. 1 Corinthians 4.7. 2 Timothy 1.9. And then we could start branching off from there. But that's unconditional. That's all God unconditionally doing these. Now, what if, what if it sounds as if we're doing something and we're proceeding to look, to seem righteous, believe on this day and, and you will be righteous or believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will have eternal life. What if we see that and it's like, oh, wow. So if we believe we'll have eternal life. Yeah, I won't argue with that. It's the, the idea is this. They think it's of them that's believing. If you're a person who believes that it's not unconditional, you think it's on you. It's not. The reason why anyone believes in God is because of God. Romans 3.11 says, no one seeks God. God says, if you, beseek, if you will seek for me with all your heart, you will find me when you seek for me with all your heart. Well, Paul just contradicted himself. Either Paul's lying or God's right. God says, if you seek for me with all your heart, you'll find me. Paul says, no one seeks for God. How is 